My son, my son, remember the chains when gold ruled with iron reins. We roared and roared and twisted and screamed till ours avail a better dream. Hello everyone, I'm Natasha and today <laughs> I'm finally discussing and reviewing Morningstar by Pierce Brown. Morningstar came out in early February. I did a lot of stuff with Pierce around that time. I hosted the signing in LA and we also surprised some fans. There's videos of that all on my channel if you want to go check those out. But I'm filming this review in April and that's not because this book is not amazing. It's because it is amazing and I didn't want it to end. I received Morningstar early. I got about like a hundred pages done before it actually came out and then the whole process of reading it I was actually audiobooking it and I was only audiobooking it when I was driving. It took me a while to get through it and then finally like the last 200 pages I just sped right through them and so now I get to talk about it with you guys. This is the third book in the Red Rising trilogy. First is Red Rising, second is Golden Sun, now it's Morning Star. I only did a review on Red Rising. But my friend Kat has an incredible review of Golden Sun and I'll link that in the description box. But I mean this is the third book in a trilogy. I, I don't want to spoil anything for you guys. If you haven't read it yet, if I haven't gotten you to read it, I don't know what's wrong. You should read this if you watch me. <laughs> Even though Pierce is a dear friend, his books are out of this world crazy, entertaining, and fantastic. Red Rising and Golden Sun were like my top two favorite books last year, and this one is probably going to be my one of my favorite books of this year. For the non-spoilery part of this video, I don't want to go into much, obviously. Red Rising follows Darrow, and he is a low color in this inter-solar system society. He's what they call a red and it's a whole color cast. So the society is based on a color cast. We follow his rise from a red to a gold and his journey in becoming a man and becoming a leader. My favorite part about the Red Rising trilogy is that Nero makes some very unexpected moves and you can't ever predict them and that's just the most fun part of reading this because I'm always so shocked. So when I was driving and I was listening to Morningstar like there were some shocking things happening and I had to like pull over to absorb it all. I was just crying in the car. I was like what? What? <laughs> Can't help but react to Pierce's book and especially Morningstar. So if you haven't picked up Morningstar and you read Red Rising and Golden Sun you need to finish it. You need to see what happens and also Pierce announced and Random House announced that he is continuing on the story. I think it's so cool like he's building a legacy with these books. So we have the first trilogy now we're gonna have the second trilogy and who knows what's gonna happen after that. And plus with them working on the movie like th th it's just an exciting time and I'm really happy for Pierce and Morningstar hit like number one bestseller its first week on like it hit every number one on the chart and I was so happy and thrilled. Please get on this bandwagon now. Iron Gold doesn't have an official release date. It's probably gonna come out more than a year from this release and less than two years. So maybe sometime in 2017, like maybe fall 2017. I don't know. I'll talk to Pierce. Hopefully we'll do another video and we'll talk more about now the finished Red Rising trilogy because I would love to just like talk about all the spoilery things with him. It's time for me to talk about this book, like everything. So if you haven't read it yet, please leave. You don't want to be spoiled. I'll leave some videos down below that aren't spoilery that you can watch of me talking about Red Rising or with Pierce and you can enjoy those, okay? When I first opened Morningstar, okay, I got it early, super excited. Oh, I forgot he signed it. <laughs> it says, to Natasha, my road trip howler. I hope we are OTP cookies again next year. <laughs> oh, he's cute. So when I opened the book, we have this map. And I studied it for about like 15 minutes, I remember. And I'm like, what does this all mean? What's the Moon Lord's Rebellion? What is this? And then we flip to the next page and it says, the story so far. So we have little summaries of Red Rising and Golden Sun, if people didn't remember. Also, when it says the story so far, kind of reminds me of Star Wars and also Supernatural, like, you know, like the, the season finales and they play My Wayward Son. I want to see if this sounds good. Do 
Darrow is a red, a lowly miner slaving away below the surface of Mars. He toils to make the surface of his planet habitable for the future generations, but he and his kind have been betrayed. Okay, so, um, yeah, that was cool. Since I didn't do a review of Golden Sun, let's just recap what happened. So the triumph, everyone dies. Fitchner's head was just, just, <laughs> but what actually made me very mad and I wanted to like scream at Pierce was that he killed Victra, who is my favorite character from the series. Like after finishing Morningstar, she is my favorite character. I do enjoy Mustang. Several is a hoot and he's always makes me laugh, but like, Victra, is, she's she's just, she's my girl. And then we found out that Roke was the one who betrayed Darrow. And the Jackal knows that Darrow is a red. We find out in Morningstar that Harmony, I think, was the one to tell the Jackal. So, Morningstar opens up. A year later, a year? A year? <laughs> what? We're reading about his torture and he's kind of going crazy. I'm like, oh, Daryl, you're fine. Just suck it up. You've gone through worse things. I mean, you got carved. To me, I was thinking like, oh, you know, he's probably only been there like two months, but then a year. So Daryl, I understand and forgive me for thinking that you need to suck it up. We're meeting Darrow at a very low point. Darrow is just like skin and bones. He's not the man he used to be. And it took him a while to even get to that point. I like that he had a uh, prisoner name. Prisoner L17 L6363 and I'm like prisoner 24601. So Dare is being transferred and then he gets rescued by Holiday and Trig. They are greys and they are sons of Ares. They save Victra and she's paralyzed from the bottom down. So she's not dead. On the way out from getting Victra, they kill Vixis. So Holiday, Trig, Darrow, and Victra are all caught outside and Trig dies. I was starting to like this kid and then Pierce just goes and slays him. I had read this portion um, when I was in the car with Pierce and we were surprising people and we were talking about this portion of the book. You killed Trig. And he's like, yeah, I didn't want to do it. And then like Mike, which is his editor, was like, no, just do it. Just do it. It has to be like the first kill. What's going to happen? Who's going to come save it? And then we hear like these rumblings. Listen to the wind, Cassius. Listen to the bloody damn wind. The two knights tilt their heads and still they do not understand the strange groaning sound that drips up from the valley floor. Because how would a son and daughter of gold ever know the sound of a quadrille gnawing through the rock? Quadrilles are coming up from the ground to save them. I was like what? He is in Tinos with his family. Here's when Ares comes in and I'm thinking like wait no Fisher's dead unless he's alive but wait how is his he his head was chopped up. Ares is actually Severo. Severo just has the best lines. I wanted to highlight I wanted to take note of every single thing that came out of that boy's mouth. So Severo comes in with this information that the society thinks that Darrow is dead. The sovereign killed Darrow. They carved some poor man made him look like Darrow and showed the execution on all of the hollow screens. But also what Severo did is that he released the footage of Darrow's carving. Not only did everyone think that Darrow was dead, but they all knew he was a red. I almost forgot. Severo has Darrow's eyes. Severo, I lean forward, your eyes. Bloody damn, did you get carved? By the best in the business. Do you like them? They're bloody damn marvelous. Fit you like a glove. Glad you said that. Cause they're yours. What? They're yours. My what? Your eyes. My eyes. He has his friend's eyes in his head. He's using his friend's eyes. Then Sever asks, do you want the eyes back? I can give them back. Dara's like, no, no, I forgot how crazy you are. <laughs> Severo is like taking charge of the Sons of Ares and he's not doing it very well. He's creating a lot more hysteria than he should be. But he also drops this bomb that Cassius killed Fitchner. This next part of the book kind of picks up a little bit more pace. The reader and Darrow also get sped up to the point where they are in this war against the Sovereign and we find out like the Jackal has taken Mars and that he is now the Arch Governor. Also the Sovereign has attacked the Moon Lords and Mustang is a part of this somehow. The new plan is to go capture Quicksilver and then they stumble upon this secret meeting with Quicksilver, Cassius, Mustang, the Telemonises, and I that's it, I think. This is the first time we're seeing Mustang, and the last time we saw Mustang was in Golden Sun, 
after Daryl revealed to her that he was a red and brought her to see his mother. Everyone gets in a battle because they see the howlers and Daryl and everyone is wearing a mask. Mustang is pinning Daryl to the wall. This moment felt very real. It felt authentic. Like this is what should happen when two, I guess, ex-lovers meet again after she thinks he's dead and he doesn't know how, how she feels about him. We find out that Quicksilver is a son of Ares. Would have helped a lot if Quicksilver was actually there for some of the things that Darrow actually needed him for, say, the triumph. Darrow's next plan of attack is to win the Obsidians or the Valkyries. On the journey to get to the Valkyries is probably the most depressing thing that happened in Morningstar. Ragnar dies. No. I know a lot of these characters were gonna die. I just didn't know who. Pierce created Ragnar as an apology for Pax. And he kills Ragnar. His apology for Pax. In my notes, I said, Pierce killed another beloved. Pax, now Ragnar. We did get a very nice death scene. Ragnar got to see his sister again, Sefi. Any of these like hand-to-hand -hand combats that happen in Pierce's books, I'm always just, I'm so nervous. There are so many points where you're like, yes, yes, get them. And then there's like, uh, no, stop. I thought Mustang had killed Cassius. Like she, well, she put an arrow in his throat. I didn't really want Cassius to die at this point. No, 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 no. Don't kill Cassius. But then, but then Aja killed Ragnar. I'm like, wait, 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 you can kill Cassius. Just kill him, kill him. One of the most emotional parts of that death scene is when Ragnar says, I will give you your love. The end of the chapter says, Ragnar Valaris has left this world. Why do you have to kill him? Cassius gives up the information that Jackal has stolen all of the nuclear warheads that the Sovereign has put aside just in case of another uprising. In 40 days, we're going to destroy the Sword Armada and rip the beating heart out of the Society War Machine. Now, I'll take your bloody damn questions. But to take the Sword Armada, he needs a bigger army, so he has to go to the Moon Lord and try to get his fleet. So Mustang comes with Romulus's sister, and they want to take just Darrow, only Darrow, to meet the Moon Lord. Several's not too happy about this. So you can lure us into a trap. Several asks. Better idea. How about you tell your bitch of a brother to honor his bloody damn agreement before I take that rifle and shove it so far up your fart hole you look like a shiny pixie shish kebab. Where does Pierce come up with this stuff? Does he like have a friend who says this? Mustang's like, Several, please stop. Not here. Not now. Not with these people. I could give a shit a piss who this is. She knows who we are and she ain't got a little trickle going down her leg standing toe to toe with the bloody damn reaper of Mars. Then she's got less brains than a wad of ass lint. The Vila goes, he cannot come. So Daryl meets with Romulus and he thinks this is gonna be easy, a walk in the park. He's gonna get the fleet and you know, he's going to battle with a sword armada and he's gonna win. The Sovereign had kind of the same idea that Daryl did. Roke is there. I'm a little bit like Mustang and Victor in this situation where I like, I could care the least about Roke at this point, but I still feel for him because Daryl does. Romulus is actually listening to both Roke and Darrow in considering going with the Sovereign. The Sovereign who is aligned with the Jackal, who the Jackal's like right hand woman, Antonio, smashed his daughter's head at the Triumph. Why do they even have to go through this like debate? over who should get the fleet of ships. It's ridiculous. So now that Romulus has agreed to give Darrow his fleet of ships, he lets Sproke go because he's a man of his honor and he's gonna let him go. You know, they're gonna battle it out right in front of the moon. And now here comes the most epic battle in this book. I was so excited when I was writing notes that I literally just wrote epic as shit. We also have this like ritualistic conversation that all the howlers have before they go into battle. Now Sefi has a calm. She doesn't really know how to use it. Why do we laugh and speak like children? Bloody shit in a handbasket! Several yelps. Turn down your output volume. I do not understand. Your output! What is output? The quiet is a bit of a misnomer, eh? Victor asks. Mustang snorts a laugh. I'm glad that like Victor and Mustang are friends now because Victor did not like Mustang at the beginning of this book. Darrow has this whole plan in mind that he wants to create a asteroid minefield for Roke and his ships. He has several waiting out on the other side of the moon so as soon as like this battle is going on and like the moon is rotating several is gonna come and like save everyone. In the meantime Daryl has to get into Roke's ship 
So the way he does this is just crazy. He uses claw drills. So the Pax is being boarded by Roke's army. Darrow has the claw drills on the very top level of the Pax. Nobody else but Reds can actually operate these claw drills because they're the ones who have been operating them for hundreds of years. The imagery from this scene was so real and epic in my mind. Like I could just see Darrow and the the rest of the Reds just going through the packs like boom, 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 gaining speed. So they go through one level and the next and the next and the next. And then they hit space with all this momentum and go spearing in to Roke's ship. Victor and Holiday and the rest of the Howlers come on board. They call out to the low colors to open the doors and the doors are opening. Victor and Dara are prowling up to Roke. We pair off on the metal bridge in the Hydra. Victor taking the right, me the left. The Praetorian is shorter than I, her helmet off, hair in a tight bun, ready to proclaim the grand laurels of her family. My name is Felicia Ah. I faint a whip at her face. She brings her blade up and Victor goes diagonal and pales her at the belly button. I finish her off with a neat decapitation. Bye, Felicia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Pierce has given an ice cube reference. I still don't know what my feelings are about Roke. At this point in the book, I was sad for his passing and I was sad that Daryl has lost another friend. And there on the bridge of an invincible warship, as his famous fleet falls through room behind him, the poet of Demos takes his own life. Somewhere in the wind hallows and the darkness whispers that I'm running out of friends, running out of light. So after this, Daryl makes a decision that probably will change the course of the future of, of his life. He decides to destroy the docks at Ganymede. He tricks Romulus. Obviously this is gonna come up in the future in Iron Gold. This really doesn't feel like something that Darrow would do because he kills so many people just to make sure that the Rim can't come to Mars and to Luna. Right after this battle, Darrow finds that Roke has been re-watching some of the videos from their time at the Institute, and he invites Cassius to watch these with him. I'm glad that they had kind of rekindled their relationship a little bit in this part. Victor is in pursuit of Antonia's fleet. They've captured Antonia and Thistle. Victor has yet to lay a finger on Antonia. I'm very proud of her. The two women are kind of not real, eh, kind of discussing what they should do. And Thistle says, I'm gonna tell you everything. And she's near the bars of Antonia's cell. Mustang goes, get her out, get her out now. No, Victor murmurs beside me, seeing what Mustang sees. Several and I look at the women in confusion. I love that the women knew ahead of time <laughs> what was going to happen. Actually, I love that most of the characters are women. We have Victra, Mustang, and Sefi, and they're all just, they're so strong so strong female character. And this is just disgusting. Like Antonia is gross. How many times has she squashed a human's head? Why would you want to get that all over yourself? Ugh. Now we find out that Severo and Victra have been having a little affair and that Severo told her that he loved her. Nah, she just said I was an idiot. Maybe she's right. Maybe I just read too much into it. Just got excited, you know? <laughs> this is my other like favorite part. Severo. You're a lot of things. You're smelly, you're small, your tattoo taste is questionable, your pornographic proclivities are, uh, eccentric, and you've got really weird toenails. Weird, they're really long, mate. Like, you should trim them. Nah, they're good for hanging on to things. Another death that happens, the jackal kills Uncle Nero. Uncle Nero's death kind of sparks a rebellion with the low colors. Steffi has Cassius strung up. Here comes Severo to save the day. My notes say, Severo enters, shit escalates. <laughs> this stunt that Severo pulls feels like something that Daryl would do. This man killed my father. What do we do with murderers? Hang them! So he pushes Cassius off. Oh, okay, there we go. Cassius is about to die again, right? He's gonna die finally. And then Severo goes, and I'm a murderer, so what do we do with murderers? So he jumps off the ledge, does a little flip, and he's hanging himself to death. Severo! No! But it was all to prove a point. And so Steffi cut down Cassius and cut down Severo. Severo forgives Cassius. Good job, Severo. So they're in the brig and they're patching up Severo. One of the doctors, Virini, rolls her eyes. Another 10 kilos on your body and you would have broken your neck, Severo. Count yourself lucky. Good thing I took a shit before. <laughs>
Victor kind of realizes that she doesn't really ever want to lose Severo, so she proposes to him. And Victor took Severo's name, so now she's Victor of Barca. They're about to attack Luna, and this is the end of the book. I didn't know how this would all end. I couldn't predict what was going to happen. Like, what's the plan here? How are they going to take Luna? I'm like, don't they still have to go to Mars to get the jackal? I couldn't figure out how this was all going to end. Their ships are getting into position, but Darrow wants to make sure that Cassius will be safe. <sighs> I literally couldn't believe what was happening. There were a lot of twists that were just throwing me off, but this one was the biggest twist of them all. Darrow, Mustang, and Severo all go to Cassius' cell to see him off so that, you know, he'll leave, go bye-bye, and they don't have to worry about him anymore. They're all saying their farewells. And then out of nowhere, Cassius is shaking hands with Severo and pulls him in, gets him in a headlock, and there's a scuffle, and they're, they're trying to get Severo out for gold. Cassius whispers and fires six more shots point blank into Severo's chest. I couldn't believe what was happening. Don't kill Severo. Haven't we all been chanting this? Blood erupts from Severo's chest, spraying my face. He stumbles, drops his razor, collapses to his knees. Gasping in shock, I rush to him under the muzzle of Cassius's smoke weapon. Severo's grasping at his chest, confused. Blood dribbles from his mouth, bubbling out through his vest, staining my hands. He coughs it into me. He's desperate to rise to laugh it off, but nothing's working. His breath ragged, eyes huge, fear wild and deep and primal in him as Antonia cackles in delight from her cell. Don't die, I say frantically. Don't die, Severo, he shivers in my arms. Severo, please, please stay alive, please, Severo. Without a final word, without a plea or a flicker of personality, he goes still, leaking red, pulse fading away as tears stream down my face and Antonia howls in mockery. I cry out in horror. I was crying out in horror. No! I was so angry. This part made me more angry than the triumph. I thought, okay, okay, something's gonna happen. Like someone's gonna stop them on their way to Luna, but no, they get on the ship and they contact the Sovereign to say that they have Darrow and Severo. No, no, this is not how this is ending. At the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm like, this has to be a trick. This is a trick or something. Like, Cassius is still on Darrow's side. And I was right. I'm so glad I was right. But th there's other things that didn't go according to Darrow's plan. The Jackal is there. His entire fleet is there. They're going to take down Darrow's army. But also, they took off Darrow's hand. What made me think this was a trick was that they asked for Severo's bones. Cassius says, not for sale. I'm like, hmm, he's still alive. This is what Darrow wanted. He wants to get into the chamber with Aja, with the Sovereign. The Sovereign has to show that she has Darrow. She starts the broadcast of his execution, his real execution. The Jackal is going to kill Darrow with Severo's rifle. I throw my head back and I howl. I howl for my wife, for my father, for Ragnar and Quinn and Pax and Nero, for all the people I've lost. Daryl gets a sling blade and jams it right through the Sovereign. I stab her six more times in the gut and on the last rip the metal up toward her sternum. Hot blood pours over my knuckles and chest as she spills open. And then we have the fight of all fights between Cassius, Mustang, Darrow, and Aja. Remember, Daryl only has one hand. They're not going to put her down. And in this part, I'm just like sweating and, and clinching so many things, but they have a plan B. And that plan B is Severo, he's alive. Cassius throws Darrow a syringe. And I thought this was for Darrow. I, I didn't think this was gonna be for Severo. His face is quiet and peaceful, but peace isn't in his nature. And we haven't earned it yet. Even those faking eternal sleep from Narl's wicked cocktail of Hamanthus extract, I pull off his chest. Wakey, wakey, goblin. The jackal is skewered to the ground. He's like, Severo, Severo's alive. We're in a prison of four. Severo swishes his razor through the air, howling rapidly. Shut up, Aja says. Severo lunges for Aja and kills her. Yes, Aja's down. She's dead. Octavia is still hanging in there somehow. Lysander's standing over her body. How did Darrow get Cassius on his side? The Sovereign and Jackal were the ones who had killed the Bologna family. So, you know, that, that makes sense. I wouldn't like her too much either after I found that out. Everything's over. Not really, because the Jackal, Adrius, has planted those nuclear warheads all over 
the moon. The only way to get him to stop setting off bombs and killing millions of people is for Darrow to kill himself. However, Darrow doesn't do this. No, what he does do is he jumps on top of the jackal and cuts his tongue out. But Lilith is still in control of these bombs and she's setting them off all over Lilith until Lysander comes up. Excuse me, maybe you need to call my uh, godfather, the Ash Lord. He destroys Lilith and the jackal's ship and everything is fine. Oof. And now Mustang is the new sovereign of the society. Now we are coming down off of the climax of the entire story. One of the things that actually made me cry in this book was the jackal's death. And I don't want to cry for the jackal, but I cry for the jackal and his sister's relationship because they're twins. And there's so many twins in these books and just so much sibling rivalry. On Mars, there's not enough gravity, so you have to pull the feet to break the net. And Luna, there's even less gravity, but no one comes forward from the crowd as the white extends the invitation. Not a soul lifts a finger as the jackal's legs kick and his face purples. There's a stillness in me watching the sight. But Mustang, she moves across the snow in a daze to grip her twin brother's feet looking up at him as if there were a dream. She whispers something and lowering her head, she pulls down, showing him he was loved, even at the end. It makes me cry now because I have a twin brother, so I can't imagine what she was feeling in this moment. The end, the end, end, end of the story is so, it just, everything comes full circle. Daryl Mustang land on Luna and they're having like this little romantic moment and she's like, I love you more than anything. Almost. And she has a son. Darrow and Mustang have a son together. Ian was pregnant when she sacrificed herself and now Darrow is finally a father. And oh, the feels. <laughs> together we can make a world fit for my son for the generation to come. I can be a builder, not just a destroyer. I will take him on my knee and his mother and I will tell him of the rage of Ares, the strength of Ragnar, the honor of Cassius, the love of Severo, the loyalty of Victra, and the dream of Eo, the girl who inspired me to live for more. Oh, so good. Such a great ending to this trilogy. I'm so excited to see what's going to happen next. I can't wait to discuss this book with you guys. So please leave your thoughts and your comments about Morningstar in the comments down below. I'd love to hear and discuss more about this book. I feel like I covered everything. I think I've been, I've been filming for like four hours, guys. But thank you all so much for watching. Just so much love for the series and for Pierce. Leave some of your favorite um, several lines. I'll see you all in the future. Keep calm and fangirl on. 